you guys, welcome back. So today we have a couple of questions, kind of a follow-up to the video we did where somebody asked if Adam felt like he was gonna be more strict with his son versus having a daughter because of his own past and boys kind of get into trouble. And it was cute, there were some comments that were like, oh no, girls get into more trouble, which, sure. So I wrote down some of the really good follow-up questions that we got and that's what we're here to answer today. You ready? All right, let's do it. Okay. When you were inside, yep. before you had any relief on your sentence, you know how things were like really up and down for a while, did you ever think that we wouldn't get an opportunity to be parents? Did you ever kind of, no, I don't want to say give up on that dream because I don't think, I think we were both really good at not giving up on our dreams, but what are your thoughts on that? That's the reason we're here because we never gave up on it. Sure. You know, that's the only reason we're here. More you than me, because... No, no. Both of us. <clears throat> Both of us. Yeah, no, I always believe. I mean, how many times did... I promise. Right? You never broke a promise to me. That's right. I always wanted it. We always talked about it as if it was going to happen. Like, when we have kids, our kids are going to be like this, or just, like, mm -hmm. the kids are going to be like this. But there was a point, especially within the past year, I mean, I'm 42 years old, there's a window of opportunity as a female where you lose out on that. And so I got to the point, and I've talked about this on other videos, where I wanted it, but I didn't feel as if my life was incomplete if I never had it. But I did have to spend some time soul searching and really, really ask myself if that was something that I personally felt I needed to fulfill within this lifetime or on my deathbed I'd look back and regret. I decided that I was perfectly content not being a mother, although I wanted to be. I didn't realize how much I wanted to be until we're in the situation where we are blessed with the opportunity to be parents, but I was perfectly content and fine if that never happened for me. I never gave up hope on it, but as the years progressed, I thought the window was shutting more slowly and more slowly and as we got further along and things got pulled away i felt like it was slamming shut and i was okay with it i never wanted to explore other opportunities like having a child on my own or adopting a child on my own or fostering a child on my own but because for me that wasn't right i didn't feel like i wanted to bring a child who were new to them you know bring them inside of prison you're not their biological father it, it would have just been confusing and a lot and this is hard, I mean, being pregnant so far has been really hard. It would have been a trillion times more difficult doing it without Adam. Props to all of the single mommies out there. You guys are, wow, well, amazing. amazing. Mothers are amazing in general, but single moms, you guys are rock stars. Okay, so along the same lines, when you got out of prison, did you think you'd get that opportunity? I mean, as soon as I was getting out, like obviously that was at like <coughs> the top of the list. Although I do have to say, I mean, everyone was pretty, uh, not like there was any pressure or anything. <laughs> the first day. The first day, the first week, it was like, you guys aren't pregnant yet? Huh? Are you going to have a kid? Or if what? You, if we made live videos almost every day, especially <laughs> the first week. We were trying to do it every day for a year. It just wasn't feasible. But if you go back and watch those videos, like the comments will be like, have you made a baby? Make a baby. It's time to make a baby now. Yeah. Actually, we both got a little bit weirded out because we're like, it do we a, want that? Like, yeah, do we want to do that lie. right now? Yeah. Are we financially, are we ready? Like, uh, we, we don't even have a home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I questioned it. I just thought, well, it'll happen if it's meant to happen. And if it's not meant to happen, it won't. I don't know that I wanted it as soon as it happened, but you were more excited than me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Probably. Because I remember I freaked out. So, <laughs> either... I don't know exactly, like timing wise, right? I don't know if I was pregnant and I got like a period or if that first month when I thought I was pregnant and then I got pregnant the following month. Did I explain that right? Mm, I think so. I don't know if I got I pregnant. Think everybody will follow that. Yeah. Sure. I was really, really upset and like this can't be happening. Like it's too soon. You've been out of prison for like less than 30 days. We're not ready. And I remember we were standing, this can make me cry because oh, I am pregnant and hormonal, but we were standing in what's now the baby's nursery in the doorway because we have a pull-up bar there and we were about to do pull-ups and i like, looked at you and i was like i i don't think we can, I, like this can't be happening and you were like but if it is i'm not gonna be upset <laughs> we'll be fine that'll be exciting 
And then either I was at that time where I was pregnant like two weeks later. That kind of answers the question, were we trying? We were, we not, were not trying. <laughs> we were not preventing. <laughs> yeah. I also had a conversation with you like a couple days after that because I had gotten my period, I think. And I think we were laying in bed and I said to you, I was like, you know, not yet. Like We don't have a house. We don't have the room for it. <laughs> but <laughs> things happen when they're supposed to happen. <laughs> but the weird thing is, I think I was more freaked out at that point than when I took this second test or like fifth test, <laughs> but the second time round of tests, I think I was like, okay, all right. Like I'm gonna freak out a little bit, but this is cool. Like we could do this. Well, I think you had the first freak out. Yeah. So that kind of got it out of your system. Yeah. So that when it actually came around the second time, I guess it just wasn't, as, you'd already gone through it. So I think the chain of emotions was just, you were a little bit, you got to the end of it a little bit more quickly like, ah. We're good. It's gonna be fine. We'll it's be gonna fine. be great. We'll figure it out. Who's yeah. ready to have a baby? Not many people. Even yeah. if you think and you're trying, you're trying, you're trying. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. And I think you said it in the last video. I think that age works in our favor on that one because we just Definitely. we know we're not prepared. We know you just have to figure it out as you go. And I'm sure I'm gonna call my sisters and my best friends and half of you guys freaking out 50 times a day. Yeah, I think we're at a place where we're very comfortable in who we are and in what we know and what we don't know. Yes. And we're, we're open to, you know, whatever advice people have been giving us. Yes. It's like, man, we appreciate it. Cause like, when you're young, <laughs> you know it all. Of course. And when you're older, it's easier to be like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Help yeah. me. This was a really good one. So it's for you specifically. Okay. And she asked if you have a counselor or how you're getting through the emotions and feelings mm -hmm. of being overwhelmed with all of the life changes that you went through in such a short amount of time, especially with having a child and being financially responsible for another person's life, because this woman was actually a counselor for people financially who are having children. I think that's what the comment was. It was a really okay. long comment. I just kind of skimmed it right before we did this. So basically, um, that's like the biggest one, adjusting financially, but also life on the outside, our relationship on the outside. Well, let's, let's deal with one at a time. Okay. I want to address the financial situation. We're very fortunate that both of us are working. Right now. Um, for right now. So that gives us a different level of stability. But i tell you what, when we looked at the insurance plans the other day, and it was nothing. It was great for me. You know what I mean? Just me under my individual insurance. And then all of a sudden, okay, if you were to come over onto my insurance and the baby and we did the math for the plan that we wanted and it was like whoa like how do people do this how do people afford insurance like this and but hey that comes along with being fortunate to have a good job to be in a good situation i mean and again it's like you know, with everything else you know we figure it out as we go and it's not you know whatever you focus on that's what you're giving life to. That's what expands. Uh, so we're not going to focus on the negative. We're going to focus on what's working. And hey, if you know we need to, to figure out additional, you know, income, then then we work on that as well. Like it's me and baby, so you can drive Uber. <laughs> we're here, right? Like we've figured it out thus far. Like pretty amazing. So you're not concerned about that. Yeah. So that's the finance part of it. Mm -hmm. What about the other, all the other adjustments, right? Because the mental, the emotional, all of those things. Yeah. I think, you know, and I'm glad people keep checking in because I know it's done out of, you know, Karen concern. I have been so fortunate for me this time through, and I'm going to attribute it to visualization, to all of the preparation, but above all else, you being literally right by my side throughout all of this. I can't tell you how significant that was. And I can go back to, you know, when I was 18 to 21 in the state prison, I thought I was fine. I thought I had it together. It wasn't that long. I got out. I went through all of it, all of the PTSD. When I went into the grocery store for the first time, I freaked out with all the people around. And I'm like, I, I didn't, I had no understanding of what was happening, uh, even on the way home. You know, I told you this, with, I'm in the car, my mom came and picked me up. And on the way home, I just started sobbing. 
and I didn't know why and she's like nervous she's like what's wrong like what and I could tell like she was she was almost like scared and I'm like ah, I don't know I don't even know what to tell you it was just all of that pent up emotion was coming out I didn't know how to deal with it this time through despite the length the duration of my incarceration I was very fortunate throughout the second half to have a, a strong peer network guys that are like family to me who were there to support me through that we supported one another through that and it was very conscious it was very intentional uh, in dealing with the emotions and making sure all of the conditioning that comes along with prison I mean that's what all of the classes that we designed that we taught that's what they were all about to make sure that that psychological impact, you know, the trauma that is created by living within those environments, we did everything that we could to, to buffer that, to make sure, like, it's still gonna leave marks, no doubt, believe sure. me. And there are things, I would say at this point, the emotion, like, I am occasionally overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude, with just awe. I mean, even like right now, talking about it is almost, like emotional for me and it's not none of it in a negative way it's all in just such a, a sense of appreciation I was telling a, a group that came through the office the other day a, a group from another city that came through wanted to see the organization and I was talking to them and telling them all about it and of course I shared a little bit of my story a couple of the individuals with this group had done lengthy periods of incarceration 20 years in prison mm. so as we're talking about these these aspects of transition and I'm saying listen I've been out six months and they're like what six months and I'm explaining all of the things that I'm saying here what's been so pivotal in in me making this smooth transition anytime I got frustrated you were right here like you kept me grounded in everything but now even just these few months being here being grounded driving home from from work I'm in the car I go to get on the expressway and I drive the the ramp up onto the highway and when I come up I'm looking out at the mountains like we can see the mountains back here which is pretty cool and I think you can see them behind us but we're like Vegas is down here and there's mountains all the way around and the sun's starting to come down and there's palm trees and all these homes and I'm looking out at all of this as I'm getting ready to get on the expressway and I'm just like wow and nobody else is looking at that you know, nobody else appreciates it the same way. Sure. So it's that sense of awe and gratitude and every single day, and I'm filled with that. And there's times where that becomes overwhelming. Yeah. And I just have to like take a breath and be like, wow. Wow. And I get it because I think we were talking about this the other day. It, you were saying like, I just, I, I get overly emotional about things. Like, am I pregnant? We both joke about it. But I think it's because for six months, we've just been going and going and going and going. And it's not that we haven't taken time to stop and smell the roses, because obviously you just explained it so beautifully, but I think it's just so much has happened, like so many huge life altering yeah. things have happened that there's just not time to stop with each one and reflect. And so I think it's just so beautiful when you do get those glimpses of the, the moments like you were saying or like right now or like just this. stopping thinking like did you think a year ago that you were going to be a dad in a couple of months uh -huh. would you have ever thought that no that's where the emotion becomes overwhelming but all in a good way and i could say this a lot of people can be in denial of things like oh i had no problem transitioning but they had they were a hot mess from the outside looking in you really weren't there were things that i was concerned that you would struggle with that you weren't at all the biggest problem was minor things with technology that would get frustrating but even the way you handled those frustrations yeah were very different compared to how i think a lot of people would compare them as long as you keep him well fed and i'm only saying that because it works both ways well fed and we're not very, angry very true well fed and well rested we're both both adamant about getting plenty of sleep Listen, like, just nothing good happens when you're short on sleep. No. Or not well fed. You ready? Because we got about a year of that ahead of us. Yes. And, we, and we'll get through it. You're doing great. You did great. You're doing great. We've been very blessed. And, you know, if you do have those minor moments, which really haven't come up, at least not yet, you do have those very close friends who have been there that you can pick up the phone and you can call them and they'll yeah. talk you through. Like, this is funny. I never even told you this. So Adam was setting up to do his very first huge 
day-long training for Hope for Prisoners. He was training mentors who were coming in to get partnered with people returning out of prison, returning to society from out of prison. So he was training those mentors on how to be the best possible mentors for those people. Literally, it was thrown in his lap days before. So he was practicing the technology part of it because that's the part that was kind of not even a hiccup, but could have been a hiccup for him. So he gets me and his one of his very close friends, confidants, brothers, who he's very close with on the inside. He got out a few months before you. Mm -hmm. Very, very close friend of ours. So he, Adam was getting a little bit frustrated because the technology wasn't working. He was running short on time. Now this is Friday afternoon at like six o'clock and yeah. the class is at eight o'clock the next morning. Yeah, Saturday, Something like that. 8 a.m. So yeah. he was like, oh, I gotta go. And he hung up and I turned to Keith. Your job, you gotta calm him down, not me, bye. <laughs> and he's like, I got this one. So, and, and he, did. He, he did, he can do a better job than I can. Just like my sister and, and Mary can do a better job than you can in certain moments because there's a different relationship there. I'm just teasing and I'm just telling that story to say that it's really good and really helpful to have those types of people oh, you in need your life. That. Yeah. You, you, need, you need a good network of supporters. You know, and people, we talk about this family, like our family extends far beyond blood relation. You know, people that have have just really been there for us over the years and, you know, that we've built those relationships with. We're very, very fortunate. You know, it's been a big part of all of this, this entire transition going as smoothly as it has. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. All right, this is the last question because this video is getting long and I got this question. Ooh, there's bumblebees out here. I got this question from a whole bunch of different people it's worded differently, but it's the same okay. question. Are we going to tell our child or future children mm. about your past? Will we use it as a learning experience? Or if we choose to hide it from them, how are we gonna navigate being so open about it on the internet? Like you can't hide anything when it's on the internet, especially yeah. if they Google your name, our YouTube channel, etc. I think this is gonna make it kind of hard. Yeah. I don't even think that was considered though when we yeah. discussed it. No, I don't. First and foremost, we've always, you know, with each other, we've always been just completely open, honest. Never lied to you about a single thing, not even a little thing. And I want to make There's sure. There's one thing you have to lie to me about. We have an agreement. That's a different story. You That's can tell them after. For, for what's to come. But with our child, I never, ever want to lie to him. I think it's a little bit different. It's a lot different. Our situation with everything that we do revolves around uh, the experience that we've been through, having been in prison, advocating for others. Like, it's such a large part of who we are. And I often talk about uh, the difference in, for the majority of people who come out of prison, men and women, it's imperative for them to be successful that they need to, at some point, completely cut that off mm -hmm. and be like, that is my past. It has nothing to do with me anymore. I'm just looking forward. I'm moving on. I've built all these new associations. I'm on a new path in life. Like that needs to become the new narrative. And some people need that. that I'm saying almost everyone needs that. There are very few of us who uh, feel like purpose driven, that this is part of who we are, that in order for us to be fulfilled, we need to continue to use our experiences, to use everything that we learn, to make sure that others can benefit from it. Whether that be through, you know, reforming the system, whether it be through advocacy work, uh, you know, on so many different levels, I think that that's where we can add the greatest value. So that's how it becomes a part of our identity. This is our story, and that's why we're sharing it. So our child is obviously going to be a part of that. And just to make sure that as he is exposed to this, you know, that, that we're open, we're honest with him, we answer all of those questions. And yeah, we just let him know how things really are. And I'm fully confident that with all of the information, everything that we are able to teach him and the guidance that we can give him, that he is gonna be, listen, he's gonna be spectacular in whatever he chooses to do. And he's gonna see our relationship, our, our life, the life 
that we're leading, you know, his existence as evidence that anything is possible. I'm sure he will, as he gets older, come more to appreciate that and, and it not be looked at as such, as a stigma. He'll see the benefits of it. Yeah. So. This needs a clarification because tomorrow, on Monday, we're filming this on Sunday, a video is posting because people were asking me, like kind of getting upset with me for not seeing as much advocacy work from me since you've been home. And I posted like, I need a little bit of grace because as much as there's post-incarceration syndrome and trauma for people who are coming out of prison, I also experienced a lot of pain and trauma. And right now I need to, is that a cop? No. Oh, I need to not advocate for everybody else's problems. There are things that we're getting behind. We will never turn our back on, but you kind of came out and went into that role for me and I'm kind of along your side and maybe even a little bit behind you on it because it's your thing and I'm healing right now and I'm preparing to start our family so and it's all explained in that video but if I don't explain it now after you just said that that's it's not gonna make sense and it's gonna sound hypocritical while while we are still very much involved in that right oh, yeah. now I'm, I'm definitely agreeing. Oh yeah, right now I'm just taking some steps back and you know, I said it in that video and I'll say it again, like nobody should fight harder for you and your loved one than you. And you can't expect somebody else to do that. What is he doing? Getting in that way. Oh. And, go ahead. I was gonna say, I just wanna add one more thing to that. Because for anybody that thinks that, you know, we've kind of pulled back. I mean, working at Hope for Prisoners, we deal with people coming out of prison every single day and they are always asking about you people know our story just us what we're doing now the life that we're leading serves as inspiration within itself but believe that there are plans there are other things that we are working towards later on this year that yes. although you know we're not going to get into those right now Believe me, you will be hearing more from us. Almost verbatim what I said in that video. Just okay. stuff that we can't talk about right yeah. now. It's happening behind the scenes. We can't talk about it. But that doesn't mean I will fight everybody's battle for them anymore. True. Uh, you have to fight your battles. You yes. have to be willing to do the work. That's why this is here. And it's grown mm -hmm. to what it's been is because I was fighting for him for all these years. There was something that you said in the car the other day, though, when we discussed this question about using it as an experience to teach him. Mm -hmm. Did you cover that? I think so. You yeah. did? Okay, so I'll add this. There were certain things that my parents did when we were growing up that I didn't understand at that point and I didn't appreciate. So, for example, my parents would make us sit down to family dinner every night. All I wanted to be like was one of those cool 80s kids with TV dinners, sit in front of the TV and watch TV and eat. And it wasn't acceptable. They were very adamant about that. Speaking about our day and, and communication and stuff like that. And that's something where I'd like to continue that tradition because I feel like family time is quality time is very important and you didn't have those kind of you just didn't have that when you were younger and yep. I think that's something that we can point back to and use his childhood as a lesson and say you know, we're doing this so because daddy didn't have that and look what happened or the other thing is and stop me if you don't want me to talk about this openly but mm -hmm. your friend's daughter will go into school and be like my daddy was a bank robber and like she'll just tell everybody because they know but they know who he is now and what he's yeah. built and he's the ceo and the founder of hope for prisoners and she's so so proud of him and how far he's come but it's cute we were at their house the other night and they asked siri or I think Siri, it was Google, Google one of those, was, yeah. who's John Ponder, and the first thing, his Wikipedia page comes up, and it was like, he was an American bank robber, this, 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 and this, <laughs> and we were all just laughing, like, can't hide anything from the kids, just like you guys said, exactly. but he is such a good example and a role model for us as a father and a parent. Yeah. They always use his past to teach his kids. What's that story with the cop when he talk, brought her up to the cop, do you remember? That adorable story he does it all the time where he you know is very intentional about the relationship his introducing uh his daughters to like he'll stop at the gas station he sees a, a cruiser there he'll pull over and be like come on girls and he takes the girls with him and goes over and, and says you know excuse me officer just just want to let you know how much i appreciate you being out here doing what you do like 
You know, I just, I want my daughters to, to see that and to have that positive exchange. Like he is hopefully setting a positive reference point for them going forward so that they see law enforcement as someone, as respected people in the community, as someone who's contributing in a positive way so that it's not, they're not viewing them as uh, someone to be feared. Mm. Uh, he's trying to set, you know, set the tone and doing that leading by example, being the one to go out and approach them himself. And listen, I, I know there's a lot of crazy things going on in this country right now, especially when it comes to law enforcement. Yeah. And but that's what I admire most about John and especially and the way he fathers is that he leads by example. Yeah. That he's not just talking about it like he literally does goes out there. And I've seen the way that he interacts with law enforcement because we have Las Vegas PD come in and do a whole training. It's, it's half a day, almost a whole day of training. Uh, with our group at Hope for Prisoners. So that's meant to, to create a new experience, a positive experience. Um, and that's all, that's that's him, that's by his design. So as a father, as parents, like, I wanna make sure that, you know, we're doing, we're setting the same example, that we're modeling, you know, that which we wish to uh, to teach, to, to show our, our child. Yeah, I mean, he has the most respectful, brilliant, hilarious like his kids are just they are they're to me they're perfect little kids they're kids i mean they're they're yeah they're great and i think that's why initially i was like man i want a daughter i want a daughter yeah. just like that yeah he has his two youngest so, are girls we still have now we're gonna have a little boy and they're gonna be like big sisters yeah big <laughs> sisters to him so and babysitters just to that clarify, was that was a lot, and I'm probably going to have to chop some out, but YouTube, Adam's name on the internet, that's not the reason why. Obviously, that's a huge part of it, and we're not going to hide it from him, just like that that was the reason for telling that Google Home story, Siri story, whatever, but that's not why we chose. It's not like we're being forced to because that information is out there. No. We always wanted to. Adam's biggest thing is to never tell a child because I said so or lie to a kid. Mm to talk through yeah. it with them in age appropriate answers that they can understand at that time. And then as they get older, you can explain things a little further, but you guys know most of your parents. That's it, I think, right? Yeah. We love you guys. Make sure you subscribe. Give this video a thumbs up because it helps us out so much. Thumbs up. Thumbs up for baby C. How do you not? Yeah. Love you guys. Mwah.